Second Chronicles chapter 12. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of the reign of Rehoboam, Shinshak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, because they had transgressed against the Lord. All right, so disobeying God will bring judgment. And I'll go back to verse 1. And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself. And he strengthened himself. He forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. All right. Rehoboam is in Jerusalem. He does wrong. He rebels against God. And the nation follows him. And it came to pass, now verse 2, that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. And we just read that in verse 1. Rebelling against God will bring judgment. With 1,200 chariots and three, three score thousand horsemen, a mighty army, and the people were without number, that came with him out of Egypt. There is a vast group of soldiers. They're on chariots. They're on horses. And they're on foot. They come from Egypt. The Libans. The Sechems. And the Ethiopians. Who knows that word Ethiopian. Here they're coming against Israel. Because they don't want to do what God told them to do. And he took fenced cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. And that's talking about uh, King Shishak. He took the fenced cities. Those were the cities that were protected. He just wiped them out, overtook them, got the victory, and he's marching on to Jerusalem. Nothing's stopping them. Why should they? They're not doing right before God. God ain't going to work with the wicked. There is no peace, saith the Lord, to the wicked. Then came Shemaniah, the prophet to Rehoboam, and to the princes of Judah, that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Before God does anything, he's going to always send somebody to tell you what's going to happen. God will always give a warning before judgment falls. That's the kind of God we have. Even though he's angry, even though they deserve the rod, God is going to warn them. And the best thing before any father that raises any children is to make sure before he uses a rod on, their, on the children, he tells them what they're being punished for. That's what God does. Listen, the Bible speaks about correction of a nation, the correction of a child, and you're to follow the principles. He sends this, this prophet to the king and the leaders. Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me. Not God has forsaken them. They left God. You know what America has done? She has told God that we don't want him. We don't want his words. We don't want to pray to him. We don't want anything to do with you. Listen, if America had its way right now, if she could, if she could get rid of every single church, get rid of that amendment that says we have the right to preach and we have the right to, to practice our religion, if they had that right, if the Roman Catholic Church and the Muslims where I have that right, what do you think would happen? Well, let me ask you a question. If you were to put America like Job in Job 1 and 2, and God were to tell the devil, okay, go ahead. What do you think the devil would do if, if God would allow persecution of the Christians today in the church? How many Christians do you think will, will be able to stand the truth? Listen, we're getting a lot of warnings. 
from God. And we keep on saying it's El Nemo, it's global warming. What scientists have completely come up with everything but God. Therefore, have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. God, now this is a terrible thing. I don't know if you realize what's going on here. God said, okay, you left me. I'm not the unfaithful one. You, my people left me. You, you you discarded me. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to discard you. That king of Egypt, let, you take care of him yourself. Listen, it wasn't by that mighty hand of God that they got out of Egypt. Now here comes Egypt back to them. Why would God, of all the nations that are in this area, never mind the world, in this area, why would God send Egypt? into Jerusalem. Solomon went back to got a wife from Egypt. Solomon went and got horses from Egypt. Solomon got everything from Egypt. And God told them not to go back to Egypt. God warned them. You say, well, that's not fair because this is Rehoboam. This is Solomon's son. Why didn't God do it during Solomon's time? Because Rehoboam has the same law that Solomon has. Rehoboam had the opportunity to do right where his father didn't do right, and he didn't. Remember when remember we read that all the priests came down from the north? Everybody that wanted to do right came into Jerusalem? This king had a perfect opportunity to stay right. Everybody that wanted God came into the land, and the king turned from God. The, the leaders turned from God. And then the people turned from God. And that's a vicious circle. You say, what about America today? Didn't the leaders turn from God? But where were the churches? Don't we have the don't we have the power of God? Don't we have the armor? Don't we have the fruits of the Spirit? Don't we can't we do all things through Christ which strengthens us? But yet, as a Christian nation, we keep on proclaiming ourselves to be, why did we fail? Well, you can't win when you bring the devil into the church. You can't win when you bring the world into the church. And we're going to see, I'm not speaking out, you know, out of a cloud, they're going to bring the world into Jerusalem they have already have. Solomon was building temples for every god under the, under the sun, but forsook the god of the temple of the god of the Bible, the god of his father, David, for worldliness. What's the biggest sin? They're bringing the world into Jerusalem. So what did, what did God say? Okay, I'll bring Egypt in, the type of the world. I'll bring them in. You want them? Here they come. So why are churches messed up today? Because God said, you want it? There you go. And when you got churches the Lord to tarry five, ten years, and your church is completely off the record, no more to be in the history books, completely dead because you didn't raise your children right, what are you going to say then? You just brought a little world in, you know, Truck the kids today and the people today, and then what's the church going to be tomorrow? And that's what God's telling this king here. Listen, you want the world? Here he is. You don't want me? I'll close the door and I'll leave you. You don't. You don't. You don't want God to say that to you. I'll say that again. You don't want God to say that to you. Even if you are a born again Christian, when God says, okay, fine, that's it. I'm out of your life. That's what you want. Boy, you are in a mess of trouble. Whereupon, verse 6, the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. Amen. They got right. They obeyed the preacher. Is it real? And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, 
So it wasn't just words. It, God, God looked down and he said, hey, look at that. They got right. Can the church repent today and God turn, turn around and God do right? Yes. Will the church do right? I don't think so. Very selected few churches. Especially today, we are in a day, if you were to preach the truth, you were going to get crucified, you're going to get fired, you're going to get the hot seat, they're going to hate you, and you're going to lose your money, you're going to lose your congregation, you're going to lose your friends, you're going to lose your family, you're going to lose it all. But gain riches in heaven. What's it say in Hebrews chapter 11? Where the world was not worthy of something like that of them. They were cut asunder. They were, they were outcasts and all that. It's where your heart is. It's where your heart is. It's either one or two places. It's either with the Lord or with the devil. It's either with doing right or in the world. Well, I walked that middle line. You've got to have a, a 49-51%. You can't have a 50-50 life. Because there's going to be one day that maybe the Lord and maybe the devil will put you on the line and say, who do you love more? It's got to be a 49. It's got to be a 51. You can't say I have a 50-50 marriage. Me and my wife agree on everything. All right, she wants a love movie, you want a Western movie, who wins? Somebody's got to get that, that overturn. Well, I go to Western, she goes to love, well, then you're separated. But here they repent, they humble themselves. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaniah, saying, they have humbled themselves. Imagine what Shem and I have felt. Well, thank you, Lord, for using me. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a break. Thank you, Lord, for your mercifulness. Thank you, Lord, for your greatness. Thank you, Lord God, for your, your mercy and your graciousness and your love. Therefore, I will not destroy them. Did you get that? God was going to destroy them had they not repented. But I will grant them some deliverance. They're going to have to pay for their sins. You realize if we did have a revival in America today, we will still have to pay for the consequences of being in the world, the church that we are? There's still a consequence. Listen, you can cut off your arm and get saved and glory to God. That arm is not going to grow back. And my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak, or Shishak. God is going to pour out his wrath. He was going to destroy him. He was going to leave him without a deliverer. Had they not repented. God was angry. And this boy watched the temple being built. And watched all the fame of the Lord working with Solomon. The wisdom. The knowledge. The understanding that Solomon had that was God given. And this boy has caused... The nation to be divided that's never been put together since. And he just almost had God destroy Jerusalem. I wonder if he's thinking about his grandpa David. When when God told him, said, Listen, I'll give you three things, you choose one, and David and the Lord sent the angel of the Lord out there destroying. And David looked out the window and saw that angel. And the mercifulness and the gracefulness and the wonderfulness and the loveliness of God. He stopped that angel. God is not this God that he wants to kill everybody in this earth. He gets angry. 
But even in his anger, mercy and grace comes through. Listen, when a man goes to hell, it is because, not of God, because he has rejected everything God has done for him. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the country. Listen, you guys keep running to Egypt. Okay, fine. They're your servants now. You're going to serve them. You don't own anything no more. You are a conquered nation. Egypt has gotten the victory. And don't you know that that makes the devil happy? I won't want I would not want to make Lucifer or Satan happy. That's not the one person I would like to please. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. I thought they repented. I thought and they got right. I thought God, yeah, but it, you still got to pay the piper. You still sin. You still got consequences. You got liberty. Out there in New York Harbor, you got that Statue of Liberty. You're missing the Statue of Responsibility. You got to owe up to your sin. Oh, I put them under the blood. Doesn't that erase them? Doesn't God not see them no more? Yes. But consequences. Putting it under blood doesn't give you a license to commit more sin. When God tells you not to do something, not uh, that it is a sin, and you continue to do it, and you continue and enjoy it, there's, there's going to be trouble, there's going to be tribulations, there's going to be problems. Well, I know somebody, you know, who smoked cigarettes and tobacco and all that, and they never had lung cancer, and they never had these problems. Well, God was gracious. But I guarantee they had another problem. It all comes down to, in the end, anyway, we all die. Came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord. Look at that. You know why God had to take those treasures away? You remember when they were in Egypt? Remember what, what he told Moses for the people to do? You are to what? You are to borrow. Remember that word? When I told you way back in, the, in Exodus, remember that word borrow? It didn't say take. It said borrow the jewels, borrow the gold. Well, guess what? The king of Egypt is coming back to get what, what they borrowed. You kept wanting to go back to Egypt? Okay, everything you got out of Egypt that night with Moses, that great night that God finally got the victory, they came to the Red Sea, and God gave them the victory across the net. That, uh, that body of water, and when they put all the gold and all the silver, all the precious stones laid out for the temple, I mean for the tabernacle that Moses was going to build for God, now it's all going back to Egypt. You don't get to keep it. Now, what do you learn in your Christian life with that? You keep living in the world, and everything you've earned in heaven, everything you learn for eternity goes right back to the earth. If you keep living in Egypt. It goes back to Egypt. You know, you know what Peter says happens? It burns up in a fervent heat. You lose it all. It goes all back. Everything done for Christ will last. Everything done for self will burn up. People don't realize. You've got to learn, learn Christian. You've got to understand. Your house, your car, your family, your money, everything you have is given to God. It's given by God to you. You have the opportunity to use it for Jesus Christ, or you have the opportunity to use it for self. And if you do it for self, it doesn't get counted. It's it. It's gone when you stand before Jesus and judge and see the Christ. Everything given to Jesus, everything done for Jesus will last for eternally. 
And Satan or the world cannot keep their hands on it. Yeah, what you do eternally for Jesus, you may be buried naked in that box and you're deaf, but guess what? You've got a heavenly bank account. It was borrowed. Now they're taking it back. And the treasures of the king's house. He took all. All what? All that was borrowed. He carried away also the shields of gold, which Solomon made. Remember I told you the other night when we those those shields of gold. They go back. And I got a, a note here, Exodus 3.22 and 11.2. We to go back and read. One of those verses, if not both of them, we'll talk about the borrowing. I guarantee it. All right. They've sinned against God. They had a gold standard. America had a gold standard. Now you're giving a piece of paper that's not worth anything. You know, the churches will do good to study Second Chronicles 12 to get right because you're reading in America. Instead of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass. Brass is not as valuable as gold. Brass is down there in the bottom. And committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard that kept the entrance to the king's house. So their standards has been lowered because of the world. Did you get what I just said? I said the standards have been lowered because of the world. You know what churches are today? You know what Christians are today that, that romance the world? Your standard has been lowered. You have gone from gold, which is, which is one of the elements of uh, the judgment seat of Christ, to brass. Brass is judgment in the Bible. You've gone from a gold opportunity for Jesus Christ to judgment. Your works will burn for all the worldliness that you live for. God will judge what you do for the world. Wood, hay, or stubble will be judged by fire and turned into ash. Now you can uh, you can come up and say, well, there's no envy in heaven or anything like that. Well, why does God give some crowns, one, two, three, and four, and gives none to those who didn't do nothing? Why not just have no rewards at all? God will reward those that do what he told him to do. And some kind of account in eternity, you, you're going to be sorry if you don't get at least one. And they're easy. I think once we, uh, i got a couple other ideas for studying and all that. And that may be one of the things we go to study the judgment seat of Christ. That's one I keep doing, overdoing, and keep doing. That's an important thing. And when the king, it says the king's house, he took the brass and put it in the entrance of the king's house. What did they put in the Lord's house? Absolutely nothing went back to the Lord's house. They came out empty in the Lord's side. And when the king entered into the house of the Lord, the guard came and fetched them. And brought them again into the guard's chamber. When the king went to the Lord's house, then they went and got these brass shields, but they didn't stay there. And when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him. Notice how the Lord re repeats that. When the Lord repeats something, it's very important. God repeated that this king humbled himself. You know what God really loves? He loves when you humble yourself and get right. He loves that more than the birthday of his son. That he would not destroy him altogether. And also in Judah, things went well. You want things to go well with you? 
Repent. Humble yourselves. Get right with God. And whatever you have coming to you, you say, Lord, I deserve it. I ought to get worse. But your mercy and grace, you love me. You're going to take care of me. You're going to get me through it. And things will be well. Now that's Old Testament. You know what the church age says? You know what, the, you know what Paul says about the Christian? All they that live godly shall suffer persecution. You may do right and not have a well life. We're in a day and age today that other Christians bother Christians for living right. Paul even wrote to one of the churches there. He said, have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? And that's just as good as 2013. What? Because I tell you the truth? You don't like me? You don't want to have anything to do with me? You talk behind my back? Well, hey, listen. You just fulfilled scripture. And you don't even realize it. It's not the people on the street that, that bother me, that cuss me out and stuff like that. That don't bother me. They're the world. They don't know any better. I weep for them. But when you get a Christian that comes up and bashes a Christian for living right, that's what turns my heart makes me sick. And then they turn around and say, they tell people they're a Christian and they love the Lord. And those are the type of Christians that you just pray and say, don't, please, don't, don't shut your mouth, please. Because if you witness, if you've told people about Jesus, you've come across at least once, guaranteed, in your lifetime, somebody will say, oh, I knew a pastor, or I knew a Christian, and I don't want to hear it. And you know what? I don't want to ever be that Christian. I don't want to be someone's excuse. So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem. And this is recorded that, you know, he did well. He did what God wanted him to do. He got right. And he strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. Well, we just read in this, in this chapter that God was going to destroy him and Jerusalem mightily had he not repented. It's the mercifulness. It's the gracefulness. It's the loving God that in verse 13 that he is still reigning. For Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign. So when, when he's talking to these, these, these young men that grew up with him, he was over 40 years old. He wasn't no 13, 16 year old little kid. 40 years he, he, he lived watching Solomon, his father, reign. Living amongst the kingdom. Living amongst the wise men. Probably seeing those two women come up before Solomon and say, you know, this is my baby. No, this is my baby. No, it's my baby. No, it's my baby. Probably watch the Queen of Sheba come up. Probably watch all of these people come up to his father and seek the wisdom of God. Seeing how God worked. Watching that this whole entire land, is, I mean, the gold is, is like rocks. And at 40 years old, he doesn't even have enough sense to get the proper counsel and to follow it. You know what that tells you? And I believe Job or Proverbs said, just because you're old doesn't mean you have sense. Don't go to somebody just because they're old and gray -head. You better find out if that person has got sense and is, and is rewardable and is right to give advice. Because if he grew up with these people that he sought advice, he said, you know, my, 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 my father's finger, you know, like the thing, my little finger, my, I'm going to be like, the, like the, the thigh of my leg. Those guys were 40 years old too when uh, Rehoboam sought them. And they didn't have a lick of sense. 
You know what's wrong with the people on Capitol Hill? I'll tell you three things are wrong with them. Number one, they're not saved. Number two, they never had to fix a toilet. I guarantee they call somebody when they're toilet or a pipe brace or uh, throw out a lamp if it don't work no more and just go buy a new one. I guarantee it. And you say, what's number three? They're hot house plants. From a lap of luxury living up with maids and servants and uh, private schools and going to college and then going into that kind of work and never live real life. Now the fact is when a checkbook says there's no money in it, you cannot spend any more money, but they do. Shows they have no common sense of what life is. That guess what? I ran out of money to the next check. I'm in trouble. He was 41 and 40 years, 1 and 40, which is 41 years old, when he began to reign. And he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, 12 tribes, to put his name there. And remember, Jerusalem was in Benjamin. But uh, it's called for Judah. And his mother's name was Nama and Ammonitis. All right, now we're going to start seeing mother's names. Important line of Christ. See that Ammonitis? They weren't supposed to marry into that. Into that. Ammonite, Moab, and uh, Edomites. I believe Amon's the, wasn't he the son of one of Lot's children? I believe. It was Moab and I think Amon. I'm not sure. But Amon's one supposed to be one of the ones they were not supposed to marry. They were supposed to marry people in their own tribe. He was supposed to marry, uh, well, his father was supposed to marry all uh, Judah women, Solomon. Solomon's wife was named the Ammonites. He went, he went right after all the, the women of strange women and all that and worshipped the gods thereof. This boy wasn't even a, wasn't even really a pure Jew. He was a half-breed. Half-Jewish, half, half Ammonites. And he did evil. Why would you like to have the Lord say that about you when you when you stand before judgment? When the books are open about you? How would you like to have God right and he did evil? The Bible is a plain book. Because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Well, Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 says you've got to have your heart to be saved. Now the acts of Rehoboam first and last, are they not written in the book of Shemaliah, the prophet? Yes, they are. We don't have that book. Don't go looking for it. And of Idol, the seer, concerning genealogy. Now that may be, uh, genealogy may be part of Chronicles. I don't know. And there were, and there were, ugh, and there were wars between Rehoboam and and Jeroboam continually, civil wars breaking out, north and south. Continually. And how many years did it say he reigned? Reigned 17 years. 17 years off and on during his reign, there were civil wars. And then he had the king of uh, Shishak come in from Egypt, come and invade the land too, on top of it. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers. Now slept with his fathers. I don't know. There's some wicked kings in the Judean line that says slept their slept with their fathers, and they were wicked and never got right. So I don't know what that statement is. I mean, we read here that said that Rehoboam, he repented, he got right, he humbled himself. But the last thing it's written about him, it says, uh, 
Verse 14, he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. At the close of his life, verse 16, to verse, we don't really see the Lord repeating that. He did get right, but did he stay right? He slept with his fathers, and you're going to see that statement off and on as we get in the kings of Judah. And notice some kings are right, they die right, and some kings, they, they, it's said, and they, die, they don't die right. And he was buried in the city of David. That would be Zion. That would be the tomb where David was buried. And Abijah, his son, reigned in his stead. All right, now we're moving on. We've, we had, we've had David. I mean, Saul wasn't really a king. He was a people's choice. We've had David, who was after God's own heart. We had Solomon, who was chosen by God, of all David's boys. And when, when God says, okay, I'll let, I'll let you go on. I'll let the next boy be king. And that next boy is Rehoboam, and he splits the nation in two. Now, as we get into the kings of Judah, there are going to be great moments, and there are going to be moments of, <clears throat> ain't worth nothing. <laughs> 